First and foremost, all praises to the Most High God. Thank you, Father God, for your only begotten Son, our Lord, our Savior, Yeshua, the Messiah, our King, forever and ever, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Bless those watching the video. Let this be for the edification of the body and bring glory into your name. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Welcome back, YouTube, to another episode of Odd Topic. So, what's fueling this? Could hate be an ingredient here? Let's dig in. Darkness, and we are the lights. And what does light do? Ephesians 5:11. It exposes darkness. We shine on the darkness and expose it, and they hate us for it. Now, how does this tie in? When you look at hate as the catalyst, turn on your spiritual mind and break it down. What can cause hate? Or what is a or what is the fruit of hate? There's this thing called the root of bitterness. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. On the BibleReference.com, it quotes. It seems then that the writer's point is about those who are disobedient towards God. Old Testament Hebrew uses the word bitter as a reference to poison. Here the bitter roots are said to cause trouble and defilement. Now whether those persons were outright false Christians or more rebellious believers, their influence is the same. They cause controversy and lead others into sin. Such persons cannot be allowed to remain in the body of believers. 1 Corinthians 5.13 End quote. So we have to be extremely careful here because a root comes from a seed. Well, who could be planting a seed? But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares amongst the wheat and went his way. And John 13, 2 specifically tells you that the devil put into Judas's heart to betray the Lord. In Colossians 1 transferred you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's beloved Son. Now the ruler of the kingdom of darkness isn't happy about that. He hates God. He hates Christ. He hates the Holy Spirit. He hates the church. He hates believers. He hates the truth. Now, Pastor Darby preached a sermon titled The Seed of Hate, and in it he mentioned love is one thing that the enemy has no weapon for. See, God's love saves and the devil's hate destroys. What demon drove you to dream up 1984? I do not think one can assess a writer's motives without knowing something of his early development. His subject matter will be determined by the age in which he lives. But before he ever begins to write, he will have acquired an emotional attitude from which he will never completely escape. A book written by George Orwell titled 1984 had some very interesting content pertaining to what we're discussing. Now in this book, the main character was a Winston who was trying to recall his childhood while staring out of a window and he begins to describe what he sees out this window. There were different towers that they referred to as ministries, but one particular tower was called Love. He described this tower being frightening. It had no windows, heavily guarded by a maze of barbed wire. It had hidden machine gun nests, guerrilla force guards in black uniform, and no one could enter unless they had official business. Another interesting detail was love dealt with law and order. Think about that. 
Now it was almost like love was locked away from the common people and something else being fed in its place. And guess what it was being fed in its place? The exact opposite. See, Winston described something that they called as hate week, which started with a screech, he said, that set his teeth on edge. They had the face of an Emmanuel Goldstein, which they considered a traitor for wanting freedom of religion, speech, and freedom of press. They said his teachings caused people to go against the establishment. Putting his face on the screen was a form of fueling the hate week. Now, get this. It mentioned that the fiction department had the task of passing out false news or what they referred to as atrocity pamphlets or atrocity propaganda which was the spreading of information about crimes committed by an enemy which can be factual but often includes includes or features deliberate fabrications or exaggerations which can include videos photos illustrations interviews and other forms of reporting or presenting now think about that biased and false news has become all too common on social media more alarming some media outlets publish these same fake stories without checking facts first the sharing of biased and false, false news has, has become, become all too common, common on, on social, social media. media more alarming some media this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. 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 The place propaganda had in the Nazi party's rise and regime remains infamous, but it was not the first time it had been used for mass manipulation and mobilization. Hitler's long relationship with the power of propaganda began in the trenches of World War I. There was a popular view in Germany, one that Hitler believed and perpetuated, that the Allied forces had won the First World War through their superior use of propaganda. He could not believe that the great German army could have been defeated by licit means. There had to be some kind of magic, which the British and Americans latterly used uh, to destroy that great invincible army. It could not be by military means, and the particular necromancy he identified was propaganda. Suddenly it was the, the new thing. It was the happy pill, it was the hypodermic syringe. Uh, which would transform everything and he had limitless faith in the power of propaganda because he blamed it for Germany's defeat. Propaganda had emerged as a powerful tool of psychological warfare, viewed as so virulent and manipulative that it would spark decades of debate about its power, its dangers and its place in a democratic society. This is no time for fear. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. You have no idea the level they're fighting on. Ephesians 6 and 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. What is all in the news right now? So Black Lives Matter is the creation uh, of uh, not just the CIA, but the creation from the CIA through George Soros. So George Soros is using the pain and the historical trauma of a people who don't know who they are. So Black Lives Matter. So that term matter represents a chemical compound. 
not because they matter in the minds of these deep state devils but black lives matter so what's the matter when mind doesn't matter because matter doesn't mind a matter is nothing more than a chemical compound a particle so then there are three witches who are leading this black lives organization alicia garza patrice colors and opa Temeti. yes there are witches listen th there's no fear in me a brother shepherd i am a contract killer i'm a uh, i'm an assassin my job is to decapitate the system that has been not just keeping my people but keeping america in bondage for the past 500 years Amen. so alicia garza is a member of omega phi beta patrice colors she's a member of omega phi beta and opa Temeti of nigerian descent she is a member of alpha kappa alpha they're all boules and in my conclusion where did george soros get the psyop of naming this organization black lives matter yeah there was the first gang in history okay called the thuggy secret society mm. yeah but it's -E. so when you type in on google images thuggy so the thuggy this is where we get the term thug it comes from that sire so the thuggy secret society were a bandit of assassins from the early part of the 1400s all the way up to the early part of the 1900s until um you know um, British, the British MI6 and, and, and the Crown took them out in the early 1900s. So quickly here before we sign off today the three founding fathers of the thuggy sicker society was a man by the name of Burram, second man Laveth, the third man morty so the first killer Burram, capital b-e-h-r-a-m his name in hindu means black Laveth, capital l-a-v-i-t-h his name okay means life or lives in hindu and morti capital m double o r t i in hindu it means dna or that which is matter oh so the first three men killers these three men baram b labeth l morti m black lives matter has become the psyop of black lives matter and their goddess who the thuggy seeker society worship was a goddess a woman by the name of kaylee capital k-a-l-i she the name of kaylee has two hinduistic interpretations her name means diva which is the acronym for the term divination i keep telling black women stop calling yourself diva because diva in hindu theology means seduction diva divination divination witchcraft but the second interpretation for the god or the goddess of the thuggy seeker society that word comes life so kaylee represents not just death not just diva or divination but also this goddess represents life within hindu theology so this is where we get the term thug life these are attempts to cultivate hate planting seeds of bitterness by way of propaganda the world is characterized by anger i don't think in my lifetime i've ever seen so many people angry about so many things 
And it all has been justified by psychology for many, many years. You have a right to be angry. Your anger is justified. You were mistreated. Everybody was abused. Everybody is a victim. You need to be angry. Anger is how you deal with the way you were mistreated. Anger has been fueled in this society for years by psychology. It's further fueled by narcissistic self-centeredism where everybody thinks they're the most important person in the world and anybody who offends them is worthy of the severest kind of repercussions. Think of the parable in Matthew 13 of the sower and the seeds. Some fell on stony ground, some were scorched, some fell by the wayside for fowls, and then the seeds that fell on good ground, bringing forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Well, what ground is conducive for seeds of bitterness? Now, in Matthew 24, verses 4 through 13, starting in verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because of iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. He who endures to the end shall be saved. They came to Jesus and Jesus was talking about so much about coming back, coming back, coming back. That one day the disciples actually came to him and they said, okay, what is going to be some of the signs that are going to occur right before you return? And Jesus began to tell of some of the things that would happen in the days we're living in. How many of you believe we're living in the days of the second coming of Jesus? Man, you got to be blind not to see it. He said, we know the season, but not the day or the hour. Well, the, 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 uh, the signs that he focused in on, I want to I wanna focus in on this morning, is found in verse 10, 11, and 12, and 13. Look what he says in verse 10. He said, then many. Now, everybody say many. Now, the word many there literally in the Greek means majority. So we're talking at least 51%. Then many will be offended. Everybody say offended. offended. Will betray one another and will hate one another. Now, this is a progression. An offended person will eventually betray. And if a betrayal is not dealt with, it will ultimately lead to hatred. The next verse, in verse 11, he says, then many false prophets are going to rise up and deceive many. Everybody say many. Who are the many they're going to deceive? The many that are offended. So you know what that tells me? That an offense is the breeding ground for deception. Okay, are you getting it? Going to war with no commander in chief, it just doesn't make sense. Are you hearing instructions from our Heavenly Father? It's a small, still voice. Train yourself to hear it. Come out of the world. Consume your thoughts with the Most High God and how great He is. The great things He's done for you. The great things He's done for us. Fill your heart with God's love. Get out of the world's hate. Start listening to gospel music wherever you are. Start listening to teachers, edifiers of the body. Wherever you're getting the word, get it and get a lot of it. Let the Holy Spirit get us ready. Don't let the enemy condemn you or make you feel guilty. Our Lord and Savior pay for all. Accept it and repent. Keep it pushing to be right. You fall, repent and get up. Don't stop. Let's get it. And even the afflictions that the enemy brings into your life are employed by the grace and the hand of God to make you a masterpiece of his creativity and a design of his function so that you literally become a weapon in the hands of God against the darkness. The scripture doesn't say no weapon will be formed against you. It says no weapon formed against you will prosper. It won't take you out. It won't keep you from your assignment and it will not keep you from your purpose.
Uh, topic. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button, baby.